time i hope you all had tea uh, could you please come in front i mean the front rows it'll be easier the ones in the back rows could just come in the front Good evening, everyone. Before we begin, uh, may I request everyone to please put your phones on silent mode. My name is Sachin Sharma, and on behalf of HarperCollins India, I welcome you all on this wonderful evening as we celebrate the publishing of our book, Reform Nation. Reform Nation captures the story of our nation's growth riding on economic reforms. For the generation that was born post the 90s, and I see some of them here, it would be difficult to imagine the India of 60s, 70s, or 80s. I, for example, was born in the 80s and was witness in part to the era of an inward-looking nation, a nation where gas cylinders and telephones were considered luxury, where a tenure waiting for a scooter was considered normal. Now, how did a nation move from a state of scarcity to high-end cars and, and smartphones? How did a nation that depended on, that depended on uh, homegrown products embrace global luxury brands? Not only that, what led India to become the sixth, the world's third, no, the world's sixth largest economy with all indicators pointing to it becoming the world's third largest economy within this decade. Gautam Chikamane has captured the journey of India's economic reforms brilliantly. An astute observer of India's economy and politics, Gautam is both passionate and optimistic when you engage with them on any topic related to India's growth. To grace this evening, we have with us the Honorable Finance Minister, Nirmala Sitharamanji, Dr. Bibek De Broy, Chairman Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, former Deputy Chairman of Planning Commission and Distinguished Fellow, CSEP, Dr. Shamika Ravi, Vice President, Economic Policy at ORF, and of course, our author, Gautam Chikamane. Without much ado, I would now like to invite all the esteemed guests to the podium to formally unveil the book. Yeah. 
I would now invite Dr. Saran to take it from here. Thank you, Sachin, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Let me also congratulate uh, Gautam for uh, producing yet another book. I think this is your third this year. Uh, um, and it's only because um, he had to travel for two weeks uh, to Europe that he couldn't write his fourth. Uh, he's been a little slow this time. Uh, you know, I, uh, of course, want to um, praise G uh, Gautam like Sachin did, passionate, optimistic, but I also want to uh, highlight a virtue that is very important for those who engage with India. You also have to be relentless and prolific. Mm -hmm. India is not a distant story. It's a story that requires deep engagement. It requires uh, constant engagement. It requires uh, attention uh, to some of the subterranean stories that are unfolding and expressing themselves through people, through institutions, through its politics. And many a times, uh, a detached assessment of India leads us to wrong conclusions. Gotham is not one of those. Gotham believes in the India story, is living the India story, and thankfully, we have people like Gautam who are now writing about the India story. And that, I think, is most important as we move from where we are today to where we would be in the coming decades. It's also very important to note that alongside this prolific author, and in sense, in, a, in some ways, uh, it is fitting that one of our most outstanding finance ministers is gracing the occasion to release this book. And I say this with consideration. She has led the country through three years, which were by no means something anyone could have been trained for. We saw a once in a century pandemic. We saw Europe go back to its old ways and engage in conflict. And we saw all of us suffering from its collateral impact. Without much ado, without noise, without fanfare, she has guided the ship through troubled waters. This book, although may seem to be about hard economics, I think it is equally important to read this book about economic statecraft. Gotham has elegantly embedded future drivers of reforms in some sense, Gotham's constant plea to reform more in this work of his. He has engaged with issues like geopolitics, the impact of technology, and of course, global economic postures as he produced this book. It is also in many ways a blueprint for us to engage with as we reappraise our days ahead. It is also a book on how to negotiate for all of us as individuals and as communities and countries, our place in a world that will continue to challenge us. I see this not as just an economics book, but also as a reference book, a handbook on the Indian economy. Everyone talks about reforms, but what do they really mean? In Reform Nation, Gotham has showcased 69 key reforms, from idea to policy, in brief but academically rigorous manner. He also has deep dives into eight industrial policies that shaped a different narrative and argues that finally, in 1991, the nation started to breathe again. Anyone wanting to write about India's economic journey would do well to keep this book handy. And finally, apart from being a book on economic policy, Reform Nation also talks about the politics behind the economics. As a result, this book is a must read for those interested in engaging with India's complex political economy. It tells us about the people, the politics, the perceptions of the time that it traces. I congratulate Gautam, and uh, it gives me great honor. It's a privilege of mine to invite our finance minister, Honorable Nirmala Sitaramanji, to speak to us on this occasion. Ma'am, the mic is yours.
Good evening to the author of the book, to the publisher, to Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, Vivek Debroy, Shamika Ravi, who are on the dais, and also the imminent gathering before me. I'm very pleased to be here to be part of, uh, what should I call it, unveiling of the book, uh, releasing of the book, because it's obviously available since September of 22. But of course, in this uh, era, book discussions happen as the release also happens, just as we've released this book. And this is the probably the first one where a discussion is happening on a very, very um, contemporarily relevant book. <clears throat> it's a very well done book. A book which is a result of intensive labor in that as we read the book, you also realize how difficult it is to get data, how difficult it is to get some of these very critical documents. And therefore, for um, Gautam to have put in that kind of energy and uh, time to compile it, bring it all together with authentic references, uh, is a great service towards understanding Indian economy. As was mentioned earlier, it of course tracks how post-independence leading towards 1991, eight major steps which have been taken in the name of policies, and probably 11 prime ministers guided the economy through those years, which resulted in 1991, under compulsion or under conviction, a major reform happened. And till before that, a reform of that kind hadn't. And we have the author of 91 reform, along with many others, the author, Dr. Aluwalia, being present here, which is itself something which all of us can look forward to hearing his views, because he's been in the thick of those days, knows how exactly it happened. If thick of those days is something which we would love to hear about, and I'm sure 30 years from now, you'll hear about the pandemic time uh, reform as an opportunity which happened. Uh, so time has its own advantage, but now we have the advantage that time gives us in the author, in the way in which he's looking back at it, with the advantage again of the writer or the, the person who was in the thick of things as well being here, which is a rare advantage for all of us. So not just looking back at it from historical perspective or also from the secondary data that you have, but actually the makers of the reform 1991, at least one of them is here with us. So it will be interesting to hear Dr. Aluwalia's picture of how 91 happened. But since, <clears throat> but since after 91, six prime ministers, as how Gautam has recollected in the book, six prime ministers, but 69 major steps, uh, all of which are reform oriented, uh, have all happened. And this book therefore looks at what was before 91 and what's after 91. Of course, gives us a picture pre 47 as well when he's looking at the Bombay plan and how since then, although it has been kept in the sidelines since after independence, since then, overtly or covertly, Bombay plan has been influencing all our thoughts and the policy makers. Not just that, it gave birth to the planning commission and not just that, it influenced the first plan in a very uh, detailed manner. So India, has been fortunate that in spite of the uh, British rule and in spite of the way in which we have wrenched out a lot of what is India uh, post the colonial loan since 47 and had the advantage of going through several rounds of thinking and planning for the country. But as Gautam would put it in his book, 91 saw reform 
from being or from earlier being under sort of repressive regime in the sense of economy being controlled, economy being regulated tightly, and economy also being under strict license regulations. So he very effectively carries through the spirit of how the economy has come to be what it is today, and very effectively also looks at what it would have been if the route had been slightly different, in that the Bombay plan had envisaged uh, a certain way of entrepreneurial way of thinking about it, although it was drafted by large, very big businessmen, addressing poverty but yet keeping the entrepreneurial skill intact was probably the spirit with which the Bombay plan was written. But then later, of course, the, uh, some of the uh, recommendations of the Bombay plan did find its way in several of the plans, but the overall shroud with which the economy was taken forward was not in the, necessarily in the spirit of the Bombay plan. It's not here, it's not my intention here to say the Bombay plan is all very glorified and it should have been uh, fully carried through. But he captures, the author captures the sense of how that ran parallel, but yet the spirit of, uh, you know, the 47 to 91 was slightly different from the spirit of what was in Bombay plan. So that's been beautifully captured. And also the international context has also been very well captured by the author. Listing out of the various reforms since after 91, and even the ones before, and probably giving just a page or a page and a half for each of them makes it easy for people who would want to have a quick picture of how it's flown since 47 to today. So that's a very good um, attractive feature for any reader. I'm sure most of you all have read it, but for those who have not read it, I think that would be one of the features, saying very quick picture of how reform after reform India has been building. And the momentum has been far more uh, since 91. The numbers themselves speak. He captures 69 post-1991 and only eight before 1991. So the pace at which reforms have happened and the kinds of reforms, whether it is governance reform, taxation reform, or policy reform, regulatory reform, he captures it all. So that way, uh, it's an exhaustive attempt at getting the picture of how economy and reforms feed into each other. The only speed breaker, if any, which is also very well captured by the author, is the political conviction. Sometimes the priority of those in politics and also the decision makers, how they come into play either positively or otherwise is also well captured and the difficulties of taking decision in 91 finds a very detailed narrative. So that way I think you've spent a lot of time in looking at how the processes have worked in favor sometimes, and some other times, even if the economic arguments are very much in favor, political conviction is available as well. Taking the example of the three farm laws, which had to be withdrawn, where the political conviction is there, the stability of regime is there, talking about the Washington consensus, he goes into those details as well political consensus or, or the political stability, conviction for reforms, all of them existing notwithstanding. The farm laws had to be withdrawn. And there he, uh, the author rightly says, there is no economic argument against it. Because year after year after year, several committees, several standing committees, several specifically appointed committees, all of them have gone into the virtues of reforming farm businesses, but yet it couldn't find the light of the day. So the trajectory that India, or trajectory that reforms in India take up, sometimes very bumpy, sometimes like a cycle you come back, have all been very beautifully captured. The fact that he captures the economy its profile, and the way in which things have changed since after 91, 
is very beautifully represented by the fact that he says that when in 86 the stock market indicator indices, the Sensex came in, from among the 30 companies then, there are one, only six which continue to be. Am I right? You've quoted that. There are only six that continue to be in the Sensex list today. Many new companies have come in. Others have all dropped out. Just six of the 30, which means the profile of the Indian economy as, relate, uh, as related to sensitive, big-time, influential, stable companies which find a listing is changed so much. So that itself tells you what reform has done for the economy and why further reforms are necessary. But of course, he goes into greater detail of how reforms get strengthened by institutional support. And there he has a beautiful string of thought to say how the American way of thinking, American institutions, American think tanks, all support policy making, which to an extent was also shadowed in India. Then you have the institutions probably taken over by the left philosophies, left ideologies, and therefore you have Indian policy making also very, very much infused with that kind of a flavor. You have then the left and the left liberals. And so it goes, as much as it's happening in the US, the Chinese whose influence, whose model, Chinese model of growth, which influences the thought processes in the universities or think tanks, which happened, which happened very, till very recently in the academia in the US. All this is also captured and I am I'm happy to see that at one go he stretches the, you know, the full semicircle of the umbrella. And even as he does that, he comes back to talking about the individual reforms, like trickles of water which you know, hit the umbrella but yet get sprayed down to the earth. So the looking into details, getting into specifics, at the same time, every time going back to weave the theoretical framework behind it, are very interesting and it's, it's something which I think uh, gives the reader the advantage within a book of what in the last 75 years India has gone through in the name of planning for economy. A very uh, interesting fact which comes out of this book but which gives a lesson for policymakers is institutional memory will have to be something in which all of us will have to invest. When he talks about the way in which he gathered information on the Bombay plan, for instance, he says, I've put in much more effort than is required to even find a copy of it. Am I right? Tells you how much a critical document for India's economy and its planning which should have been natural course available easily for anybody, requires a researcher of that kind of a level to spend so much time, doesn't speak so much for us, for our documentation abilities and for our institutional memory uh, purposes. These are things which I would strongly take it for myself at least, that we should strengthen the institutional memory which is so important for us. Um, Similarly, he talks about tracing and tracking difficulties of the 1948 resolution. It, it was called the resolution, but it, it was one of the major steps, one of the major eight steps that was pre-1991. Gautam is right in saying even that, it was very difficult for him to obtain. So I think it is very important that books such as this are not read just for references or not just read for the sake of knowing what these, the content is about, but the messages they give in terms of you know, documentation, preserving certain uh, you know, historical evidences are so critical. And it's right that you have mentioned it. And I think it's important for India to remember that as we sit in Nehru Memorial Museum Library, it is important to document, it is important to keep a very good catalogue, and it's important to 
make it available for researchers in time. To end the discussions, he also comes up with a triple trinity that India will have to face as we go forward. And that was a very enchanting way of putting out as to what is important, where the attention of the policymakers should go. I quite appreciate it. It's worth recalling. He says the first trinity is of tech, technology, geopolitics, and narrative building. Very relevant for today. And the next trinity that he talks about is producers, consumers, and regulators, the essential stakeholders in an economy, which actually the set of three would always be the ones at play, and that's what is going to give the economy its robustness. And the third one is very uh, futuristic, somewhat abstract, and if you have to derive policy from it, it's going to take a bit of effort, but nevertheless, the three, the third trinity, is where he says, dismantle the colonial legal framework. The legal infrastructure that prevails will have to be dismantled. I thought it had a semblance to what the Prime Minister has been speaking as Panchpran, where the first of it is to get over that mindset, get over the colonial mindset, is what the Prime Minister has been saying from Red Fort, August 15th, 2022. And here I find the third trinity, the first one in the third trinity, triple trinity, is to dismantle the colonial legal infrastructure. The second in that is to reinstate India as a major player in the global economy. And third, he says that India should play a very important and pivotal role in redrafting emerging new world order, which is, I think, a very important job. And representing the voice of the South is what the PM has been speaking about, particularly in the context of the G20, in which India holds the presidency this year. So representing the voice of the South, and also speaking for greater representation of the South in multilateral institutions, be it banking or multilateral funding institutions, India, together with the South, global South, will have to find its place. And the reform of the multilateral institutions, certainly something which we will put on the top of our agenda. So, in a way, um, without taking much of your time, I find this is a very time-serving today, in the sense, very contemporaneously required, necessary uh, manual, if I can call that called this book that. And it comes out with very important reference material for us. Gives a very good picture of the Indian economy. Just one thing which I would want to say with a little apologies. I don't want to get into specifics of what is in the book, but this is, I thought, important. In Reform 16, it's mentioned about how new normal for personal income tax rates. Thankfully, the only place in which my name appears. <laughs> it says, and I read here, under Prime Minister H.D. Devagauda, Finance Minister P. Chidambaram, created a three-part tax structure, 10%, 20%, 30%, that remained unchanged until recently. This elegant structure continued till under the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman, brought seven slabs and four surcharges, re uh, reversing the gains of simplicity created after decades of harassment." Unquote. <laughs> and if Gautam would pardon me. If Gautam... If Gautam would pardon me, if indeed they were gains of simplicity, I want to reassure him, they've not been reversed. People are filing taxes, their returns even today under it. I have not reversed any of this, nor has Prime Minister Modi reversed this gains of simplicity. It still is there. 
But it's not at all simple. I would want to tell you that. It has full of exemptions. For every rate there are, for every tax assessee, it has about seven, eight, nine, ten exemptions. And with all that exemptions, the rate 10, 20, 30 continue. It continues even today, I assure you, we've not removed it. <laughs> but what we have done in the name of simplicity and to avoid harassment, reversing the gains of simplicity created after decades of harassment. Removing harassment is what was aimed at when we brought in faceless tax assessment. And even today I can tell you with certain level of confidence that if there are harassment or if people are willing to talk about it, there is a system through which it gets sorted out. So harassment was addressed by us, one. Second, in order to keep the simplicity and not deny those who want to enjoy the old simplicity, we've kept that system intact, it continues. But we've come up with a parallel system which has no exemptions whatsoever, but which has simpler, more favorable rates. And may not be the time for me to bicker on statistics, but I'd like to say this here. The reason why I had to bring in seven slabs was to make simpler and lower rates for those who are in the lower incomes. So just indulge me for a moment. The old tax system, which still continues, had only five, 20, and 30 slabs other than the nil rate. And 10 lakh and above were under 30%. Five to 10 lakhs were under 20%. 2.5 to 5 lakhs were under 5%. And those below 2.5 were at nil rate. So what we did in bringing a new parallel system without exemptions of any kind, you just pay that amount and you're done with, was to bring in, yes, seven slabs, only to make sure that those below 10 and 10 and below were not going to be taxed at 30%, they were going to be taxed at only 15%. We reduced it. We reduced it further down to 5% for 2.5 and 5 lakhs and so on. So no one, till they reached 15 lakh and above, had to pay 30% at all. So for everyone, there was a reduction by at least 5 to 10% in the tax rates, and no exemptions were allowed. It was a straightforward. So just one little correction. And in fact, probably I would have given the little advantage to correct it, had only I had the opportunity to meet up with the author before the book was finalized. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't have the chance of meeting him or even having any discussion about the book because I didn't even know that he was writing one. So pardon me for doing this here, but thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Finance Minister. I'm sure the, the second release will have the corrected uh, narrative. Uh, now I'm delighted to uh, invite the author to speak to us about the, his book, his uh, product of his passion and, and engagement with the Indian economy, Gautam Chikramani. Gautam, over to you. Gautam. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Delighted to be here, and even more delighted by the critique uh, of our finance minister. Uh, I will read the numbers myself, and if there is course correction, uh, make those corrections. Uh, thank you for coming here, uh, Nirmala ji. Uh, I thought there could be nobody better to launch this book or talk about this book than you. As Samir mentioned earlier, you have uh, steered our economy through the most tumultuous times. Uh, it's not easy facing flack every other day for the smallest of policy uh, gaps, lapses, implementation, execution, data change, global events, et cetera. It's not easy. And uh, more than the policy itself, I would like to commend you uh, on behalf of all of us uh, here and many outside for the courage 
with which you have gone and faced uh, this harsh uh, waters and steered us through safely. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Bibek ji. You are an inspiration all, always. Uh, the joke at ORF is by the time we finish writing a policy brief or some, some people even uh, a, a, a small article, Bibek Debroy has come out with a new book and uh, that keeps me inspired. So the three books this year that have come out, uh, sorry, last year that came out, uh, a lot of that inspiration comes from you, Bibek ji. Thank you very much. Montek ji, uh, you've been an inspiration right from my uh, past life in journalism. Uh, you may not recall I was a rookie reporter, but I would come to you for uh, advice, for, for, uh, for, uh, for windows into the policies. Uh, I would study your plans, your reports that would come out, and I, I thought uh, you were quite up there, and by gracing this occasion here, I'm, I'm really honored. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> thanks, Amir. Thanks, Shamika. Uh, for being here, and thank you everybody for coming. I want to make uh, five points, actually, the, the first of which is around, and most worryingly, this wasn't part of my speech earlier, but it happened later, is about uh, deforms. I think there is a political narrative that is gathering momentum today that is attempting to reverse the gains of reforms that have happened over the past three decades and lead us back to the backwaters of past. I'm in specifically, I'm talking about pension deforms. Uh, after a long time, in 2006, we moved uh, the government servants to a new pension system. Uh, it was, the, the previous system was fiscally not viable and everything was hunky-dory, everything was well, and I think it's a fantastic system that's going, that was functioning very well. And suddenly out of the blue, Politics comes, and now three states, Himachal Pradesh, Punjab, and Chhattisgarh, are looking to, to go back and deform the pension system, deform their balance sheets, and go back to the old pension system, which is a defined benefit system from the defined contributions. I sincerely hope better sense prevails in these three states because they will not see uh, their books getting balanced at all. I also see a lot of struggle between the union government and these three states in terms of asking for the monies of the people there. I don't know from where these deforms have come, but they are, they are spreading like COVID. Today, I read an article that uh, in Karnataka, which is a BJP governed state, uh, government servants are demanding the old return of old pension scheme in so and so in Jammu and Kashmir. This disease may continue. We need to keep our fiscal bearings in place and prevent this distortion from happening again. This book began as a tribute to the 30 years of economic reforms. I wanted to celebrate what these reforms were. I, and usually I, I, I write a book when I want to do something and I don't find any literature available. My previous book, which was also launched here, uh, one of my previous books uh, was launched here, was the result of the same thing. So I wanted to dissect what happened to us, what happened to our economy from 1991. Why did we get there? Uh, I've been tracking it for a long time, but I wanted to do it this time with greater depth. And I was quite shocked. From celebrating the 30, the 30 years of reforms through the 69 reforms that uh, Nirmala ji just mentioned, I also had to deep dive into finding why we reached where we did, what, what made us get here. How come China moved forward? How come South Korea moved ahead? How come India got left behind? Why did this happen? So I had to um, sort of excavate the old policies, the eight industrial policies, and it's a, it's a story that will make any policy student deeply distressed to see how we were captured, how a policy distortion took place, how we were all misled. And it's only how after Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha Rao started, uh, in, initiated the industrial policy in 1991 that we began to breathe afresh again. My third point is, uh, so there is enough in the book I don't want to repeat and uh, I will now talk outside the book. When I read the book as a reader now, I see four lessons. First, uh, I don't think economic policy can be made in, in the rooms of economists anymore. I think econo economic policy needs a legal awareness. 
I think the intrusion of law into economic policy is a crucial, uh, is a crucial intrusion for any policy analyst to look at. For instance, while the uh, statement on industrial policy in 1991 talked about uh, removing the MRTC, MRTPC, finally it was through law that it was done. The GST, and everything that we talk about through a policy statement converts itself into law and understanding legislation, understanding how law functions, understanding the, uh, the judgments of the Supreme Court which again turn into law and putting them in context of policy making is a crucial skill today. No economist can stand alone today anymore. You have to read the laws, rules, regulations, statutes uh, before you delve, dive deeper or give any um, advice. Second point is, uh, I find, although there are several new policies uh, that come out, for instance, Statement on Industrial Policy 1991, or uh, the Jandhan Yojana, these are new, uh, new ideas, new, new reforms. But mostly what I've seen is that reforms are a work in progress. For instance, the Mahatma Gandhi NREGA, MGNREGA, which is the most talked about scheme and the, the, probably the world's greatest uh, income security for the rural people scheme in the world uh, actually has its roots in 1952 through the community development program. It's, uh, since then, it has been honed through several years uh, in 19, 1977, 1983, 1989 to reach 2006 where we have now MGNREGA which provides income security. Likewise, GST, likewise for several others. So when you enter a policy uh, debate, I'm talking to students here, uh, be sure to go into history and context and see the evolution and to which you will add something more. The third point is credit. I don't think we have given adequate credit to the two biggest reformers uh, that India has seen in the last 30 years. First, Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha Rao. Everybody in this room, well, I, I hope not, but maybe most people that I have spoken to think that the 1991 reforms, the credit should go to uh, Finance Minister Manmohan Singh rather than Prime Minister Narsimha Rao. Uh, when you read those documents and when you see it in hindsight, for instance, uh, Manmohan Singh Ji's track record as Prime Minister, you see that actually you needed a leadership of a different caliber uh, uh, that P.V. Narsimha Rao provided and which uh, Manmohan Singh Ji implemented. But when it came to giving that leadership himself, I think he faltered. He did some good things like NREGA or uh, right to education uh, or uh, right, uh, RTI, right to information. But on the economic wealth, wealth creation front, I think he lagged the curve. The other person who has not got adequate credit is Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Everybody looks at him or talks about him and so did I, so I also believed it, that he is more of a political person, a person looking at electoral politics rather than economic reforms. But when you start counting the reforms in this book, as I hope you will, uh, you will see that most of the big reforms that have happened under any other Prime Minister, the highest number are happening under Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi. He doesn't, uh, he is not seen to be a reformer but is. Finally, I want to talk about protests. Uh, uh, every reform has had its protests. In fact, my first chapter talks about uh, a, a tale of two protests. The first protest happened in 1991, actually in 1993, through what is known as the Bombay Club, led by Rahul Bajaj, who said that the, the, the change from a, a, a controlled regime to something which is open where foreign investors can come, foreign companies can compete, is unfair. We don't have a level playing field. We are not used to functioning under such constraints and I think he had a point. I think the Bombay Club had a point. You can't just overnight decide to say that the, that the regulatory structure of yesterday is changing and now you fight the global giants overnight. So they had an economic case, whether you like it or not, it's a, that's a separate matter, but they had no political support. As a result, they were not heard, uh, but what has resulted in the process is that although Rahul Bajaj lost, Bajaj Auto has won. The other uh, uh, protest, which the big protest, is comes 30 years later in 2021, where the three fantastic farm laws, Nirmala ji mentioned them also, uh, were, uh, had to be repealed for no rhyme or reason. 20 years of debate. 20 years of debates by the best minds, the best agricultural economists, by the parliamentary committee meetings, 
by standing committees of parliament said that these three laws, not precise laws, but the essence of those three laws must be there. It, it would be a 1991 moment for the farmers, for the poor and marginal farmers. They were through violence, through protests. I, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing in Delhi. Uh, I, I think it was just terrible. Murders, killings, brutality. And suddenly those reforms had to be uh, uh, repealed. Uh, so again, every reform will have a protest. Income tax reforms have had a protest. Income tax people were complaining, it's there in the book, and I've given citations, so it's not my word or uh, he said, she said. That they said that uh, you cannot do, do faceless uh, income tax because our children, what will happen to the education of our children? Random things. So every, uh, 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 every person who is vested in the present will fight for, against the future, and we need to be careful. The pension reforms that I talked about earlier, what effectively they are saying is that 5% of India's households must be subsidized, uh, of India's affluent house households must be subsidized by 95% of the India's poor. This is ridiculous and I don't think we need to go back there, but protests will continue. On future reforms, I believe we will have a discussion there. I'm, I'm lucky that we have existing reformers and uh, yesterday's reformers to talk about tomorrow's reforms. But I just want to point one reform that I think is essential for tomorrow, and which is the compliance reforms. My friend and co-author Rishi is sitting right here. We wrote a book, uh, uh, we wrote a monograph earlier this year. It's called Jailed for Doing Business, where we talked about 69,233 compliance universe of uh, doing business in India, of which 24,134 carry imprisonment clauses. There is a bill in Parliament now uh, that is trying to, attempting to remove these imprisonment clauses. It's up for debate. We have given our views. We hope that uh, the bill will get uh, expanded. None that even if it doesn't, I think it's a great start, and, and, and we must push harder and get rid of what, uh, what Nirmala ji was talking about, the colonial infrastructure, which I mentioned towards the end of my book. This is part of that colonial infra legal infrastructure. This must end. Finally, I want to give uh, my gratitude to some people. Firstly, to all the reformers present here in this room and outside. Thank you for those reforms. We are very grateful to you. There is not a single constituency in this country, not a single constituency that has not benefited from economic reforms. Think about that. Not a single, there is not a single person who has not benefited from economic reforms. We are grateful to all of them. Second, Harper Collins, my publishers. This was a difficult book to write because uh, firstly, there was a, uh, a deadline. Secondly, I, because it was um, challenging extant narratives, I had to use uh, primary data. I had to dig in. One fourth of the book, by the way, is of citations in small fine print. So uh, you can accuse me or you can have a difference of opinion uh, with my analysis, but you cannot have a difference of opinion with my facts. So thank you, uh, Harper Collins, for being there with me. Vinayak Swami, is he here? One of the finest researchers. I never use researchers. I, I try not to. I, I'm really afraid of using researchers uh, with, with the kind of experience that some high-profile people have had. I'm, I'm really scared of using researchers. But Vinayak has been a, a, a backbone. He, he, he has really uh, he's provided the rigor. And I've certainly enjoyed working with him. You need to do your PhD and become a reformer sitting here. This is my eighth book, five of which have been written in the past five years, three of which have been written in the past one year. Now, what has happened in these five years? I joined an organization called Observer Research Foundation. This is one of the world's greatest think tanks. It provides uh, intellectual refuge to writers like me. It challenges me. Every day it challenges me, every day it encourages me, and the institutional support that ORF provides is, for, is a dream of any scholar. My thanks to Samir, Dr. Joshi, and all my colleagues at ORF. Thank you very much. My family, uh, you know, uh, particularly uh, three, four people, uh, they stood by me because in the last one year, because I was writing three books, uh, I was absent from the dinner tables, so my mother Lakshmi Chikarmane, my father-in-law Yogesh Halan, and my wife Monica Halan, uh, I'm grateful to you. You power my book and you power my life. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, uh, my readers, uh, uh, inside here as well as outside, uh, I have just one line for you. You read, therefore I write. 
Thank you once again. Thank you, Nirmala ji, Vivek ji, Montek ji, Samir, Shamika. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gautam. Um, and uh, I think um, I will now hand it over uh, to Shamika to take the discussion forward. Uh, Madam Finance Minister, will you be staying with us during the discussion? Uh, so, uh, Shamika, you have an hour of which maybe 40 minutes of conversations and 20 minutes of Q&A. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. So what an uh, engaging uh, start. Uh, thank you, um, Gautam, for writing this book. Thank you, Nirmala ji, for endorsing uh, this effort. Uh, I think researchers, the greatest uh, objective is to document and, and, and spur imagination and, uh, and start conversations. Um, the conversation that we're going to have now is, uh, is going to be on reforms in general. I think now, instead of just listing, we're all, you know, most of us are Indians here, we've been through the pains and perils of it. For me, when I read this book, uh, it was also, it jogged my memory of just each reform and the consecutive or the, the protest that went along with it. It just tells you that economic reforms uh, will always have protest in a democracy. Uh, because there is no reform, and reforms have, of course, benefited everyone, but each individual reform will have a distributional impact, which means uh, on an average we will gain, but average, remember, is a distribution. Some will gain more, some will actually lose. And then it becomes one of how do you convince the ones who are going to lose of how do they come along, right? We are seeing what is happening in uh, the Western economies, uh, we have seen the anti-globalization moves that are happening, largely on account of the fact that there are groups of demographics, of regions, that have missed out simply because jobs have shifted, the nature of production has uh, changed in a lot of these developed markets. And there is a uh, pushback against globalization, but we have gained because of globalization. Uh, just like China, we have gained, uh, most of South Asia has gained, East Asia has gained. The distributional impacts have now begun to take four. And the farm laws are, of course, in your face. We have all seen. Uh, and for the last 40 years, economists across the spectrum, whether you left, right, center, whatever, everyone argued for the same set of things, but we couldn't prevail. So obviously, it is not about how good the ideas are. Of course, let's say good ideas, we are uh, abstaining from the complexity of implementation right now. So let's talk about the economics of it, regardless of how good it is. The politics is very much a reality that we have to uh, abide by. That is a constraint that we have to, when we think of reforms, we cannot say, oh, this is a great idea, therefore let's just push it. And that is how we also have to think in terms of the, the pension scheme and why it is, you know, why is there a surge and, and, and why are political parties now thinking and, and therefore what should be the reaction and the response uh, uh, to some of this. I will start with you, Montek. Uh, you have been listening, uh, uh, very patiently, and I know you have lived through it, but we also know one other thing, Montek, that you also had to battle, in fact, most of your um, detractors in the reform process were people within the party. You actually had several eminent people who didn't fundamentally believe in the pro-growth, the kind of policies that were enacted. What is your biggest lesson? from this, uh, what would you recommend moving forward? How do we tackle, uh, I don't want to use the word dissent, it's not really dissent, there is something more sinister about it. Uh, in a democracy, how do we manage the, the people who are getting left behind and who are going to, remember in today's social media space, it's becoming easier to mobilize support. It is no longer India's farm laws alone. We have Canadians getting into the fight, Greta Thunberg getting into the fight. The narrative building is becoming much more difficult and can get out of control. So how do we manage the group that is likely to get lost in any reform? <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you for inviting me and uh, congratulations, Gautam. I would, you know, while we've gone into conversation phase, I would like to say that I really enjoyed reading the book and I, I recommend people interested in the business of Indian reform to look at it. And the nice thing about it is that the first, whatever, 20 pages, which is his preface, well worth reading, and the last 
20 or so pages, which is his conclusion, also very rich. And in between, you have a pretty interesting summary of all the different things that have happened. And frankly, one of the things that comes out of the book very strongly is how much reforms are a continuing process. So, I mean, whatever our political discourse might be, and you know, you need a political discourse, and that should be allowed to be as contentious as you like. Uh, if you look at uh, when is India going to look good? India's going to look good if people believe India's democracy. Being a democracy means there's going to be a lot of contestation. You know, democratic government is not a consensual form of government. It's an adversarial form of government. So the government will say something, the opposition will oppose it, and people like that. But you know, in the end, uh, it looks best if people say that under all this political disputation and contestation, there's sort of a consensus that the country must move forward and somehow it does. And I think what comes out uh, from Gautam's book, because he's covered such a wide uh, spectrum, is how many reforms came at different times, some kind of petered out, some were very important, and others sort of uh, halted, and maybe some have to be carried forward. St still others gain momentum. So making a list of reforms is useful because you can keep it on your shelf. And who knows, some of these things that are stuck today, I mean, five years later, when they get done, you can go back to the book and say, OK, I'll tick that off. It didn't look as if it was happening, but now it's going to happen. And I think it's very important uh, to, to, to take a look at that whole uh, process. Now to come to your question. You know, I, I mean, the way you posed it, it's as if reformers go for growth and they don't care about distribution and you could have gone further and don't care about ecology and don't care about, this is not true. I mean, the honest truth is that when we began, we meaning the country, remember when we became independent, we were a pretty poor country. Uh, I think the dominant thing was we've got to increase production. With the amount of production there was, there was going to be no sense of uh, prosperity. Then for a long period, particularly during the 1970s, we didn't seem to be able to grow. And those are all the bad policies that Gotham uh, talks about, and they're kind of doc documented in there. So, you know, it's not surprising that at that time, the dominant concern was, look, here's Southeast Asia growing at 6%. Here is, at that time, China wasn't growing that fast, but Korea had grown at 9 or 10%, Japan had done that, and India was growing at 3.5%. So the dominant concern was, let's demonstrate that India, with all our constraints, can get faster growth. But we were all aware that growth has to be inclusive. In fact, I mean, uh, in the first plan that I was concerned with, we call it inclusive growth. And then later on, when uh, environment became important, we called it inclusive and sustainable growth. So it is true that the consciousness of things like the environment uh, came later. But right from the beginning, uh, the, nobody ever thought that growth by itself uh, would be enough. Everybody knew that it needed to get down to the bottom. In fact, in my book, Backstage, I, I quote uh, uh, an exchange with Prime Minister V.P. Singh, who was a poet himself, and he said, you know, Montek, we need the kind of growth that falls like rain on the mountains and flows down to the plains. We don't need the growth that's like snow, which sticks to the mountain top. So, I mean, that I think was a very positive way of describing trickle down. Whereas in the West, everybody denigrated trickle down. He would say, look, if it trickles down, it's pretty good. And I think a lot was done and is being done. Even today, the, 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 there's a lot of focus on the welfareist aspects of policy. They all reflect this concern. But let's be very clear about it. If you don't do growth, this is going to be dead in the water. So while growth is not enough, you should have no doubt whatsoever at our income level, we need it. Uh, I mean, if you're going to talk about all these $10 trillion, et cetera, I think Bebe is in the newspaper giving a nice target for what we can achieve. 
All of that requires growth of somewhere between 7 and 8 percent. And therefore, uh, nobody should say that I'm not interested in growth, but let's try to get A, B, and C. You won't get that. And I think, you know, uh, if you look back, uh, you, you talked about uh, resistance. You know, a lot of times, uh, people making the resistance know that it's sort of nam ke vaste. But this, given where they come from, they have to make the point. I will just mention one incident, which I think also responds to what the Honorable Finance Minister said. Tell us something about what 1991 was like and why it happened. You know, this is a story when uh, it's there in my book backstage. One of the important things that were done was computerization of the banks. I mean, we could not have gone on the way our bank unions wanted us to, which is no computers at all, okay? So at one point, uh, the finance minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, invited a whole bunch of bank unions. You know, the bank unions belong to different parties, so they're very democratic. I mean, you had uh, Congress unions, BJP unions, uh, CPM unions, a lot. So they all came, and they all had the same view, uh, uh, no computerization. So Dr. Singh tried to explain to them India is developing, India has expanding credit needs, we want to integrate with the world, all of that sort of stuff. So it was a good meeting, very polite, and, and as they were about ready to leave, he sort of went to his door to shake hands with each of them. Uh, and you know, they all sort of shook hands, they were quite pleased that they got so much time with the finance minister. And, you know, one of them went up to him and said, Mr. Finance Minister, I don't agree with you at all on computerization. And then he said, you know, but I must tell you, my son agrees with you. <laughs> so, you know, I think they knew it was coming, but, you know, you, it's like where you stand is where you sit. I mean, so I think whoever is doing reforms should not expect that reforms will just happen, that there won't be opposition. That's why you need to consult, you need to talk, you need to persuade. But, you know, in the end, you can't get consensus. You've got to get it done. And, you know, frankly, if you're right, people will realize it's right. And if you get it wrong, you can adjust it. I mean, there's no other way of doing that. This whole idea of getting everybody together and getting agreement, uh, that's really not uh, what reforms are about. Great. Thank you. Vivekda, if I may come to you next. You know, uh, the more I read uh, about the response to PM Modi's economic reforms, particularly from past NAC members, who, who most of them had a very socialist outlook and, and, and some very progressive policies, et cetera. But a lot of the detractors today uh, are actually, they're all in agreement with the way amenities have improved tremendously in the last eight years. In fact, uh, I will recommend, particularly to the youngsters in the room, do read the debate between Jean Dres and Surjit Balla. And they are on the opposite ends of the political spectrum. But when you read through it, it's actually funny because they're both saying that India's multidimensional poverty has fallen significantly. So in essence, we're getting, you know, our broad strokes are all in the right directions. We are accomplishing our broad objectives. The way we are going about it, again, the politics one can differ, but economic reforms, we don't want to lose our sight of the goalpost. So Bibegda. Moving forward, particularly from the judicial point of view, because you've been writing so passionately, and I endorse a lot of what you're writing. I think these are important conversations. What is the role of the judiciary? How do you foresee, moving forward, how do we get the judiciary to be economically more, uh, I don't want to use the wrong word, but economically more literate, economically more <laughs> Uh, uh, sensitive to, uh, you know, as, as a very prominent judge had said, that there are right decisions and then there are intelligent decisions. And I'm particularly referring to the kind of pronouncements we got in the coal allocations, etc. It just tells you that our understanding of what is opportunity cost, that 18 years after allocation, it's a generation that we are talking about. So it's not about fixing things and getting things right. You have to accept that the reality has changed and therefore you want to give the right punishment for the wrong, you know, the crime, but you also want it to be 
least costly on, on the economy as a whole. So moving forward from the judicial reform side, for economic reforms in particular, what do you think are the few key things to focus on? Thank you, Shamika, and congratulations, Gautam, again. Before I respond to your question, can I make three quick points? The first book I read, the earliest book I read, which mentioned reforms in India, was called Aspects of Reform in India. It was written in the year 1886 by a British civil servant who had in mind the reform of the civil services as they then existed in India. The reason I mention this is, yes, this book is called Reform Nation, but there's also a little bit of reform notion in it. In the sense that when we use the word reform, all of us have a certain preconceived notion about what reform is. And we define the government's action in terms of reforming or not reforming on the basis of that. This is a very, very useful compilation, as people have said. Several things have happened. It puts those in one place. But there is a selection bias. And that bias is heavily biased towards the union government. Very broadly speaking, 1991 was about product markets. Post-91 has been about factor markets, very broadly. Factor markets are state government. So the cutting edge, the blunting edge, they're both at the level of the states. And you do not have really an adequate discussion. I know it's going to be your next book, but in this one, you don't have an adequate discussion of that. I also wondered a little bit about why 69. I mean, I thought you had MRTP 69 lurking somewhere <coughs> at the back of your head. It could have been VAT 69, you were too young. <laughs> it might have been chicken 69. <coughs> Maybe you wanted to make it 75 reforms and couldn't think of six. Anyway, so that's the first point I want to make. The second point I'm saying deliberately, consciously, we economists have a greatly inflated sense of our importance. We think we determine and influence economic policy. We do nothing of the kind. An economics textbook will say, Mahal and Avesh, two sector model, four sector model, determine the second five year plan. You will find no mention of the Mahal and Avesh two sector model in the second plan document. The four sector model was published later in Sankhya. We often tend to negate the negative role the economists have played. The consensus of the time, including by economists, was state intervention is good, import substitution is good. That was the consensus. All economists, barring one or two, one or two like Chennai who were ostracized. And exactly similarly, we downplay the importance of the bureaucracy in pushing reforms. A mention has already been made of the, of the political classes. We downplay the importance of the bureaucracy. And when I say bureaucracy, I don't just mean the All India Civil Services. By my definition of bureaucracy now, Montek is a lateral bureaucrat. Yes. <laughs> the reason I'm saying this is look at those earlier government committee reports. The Dagley Committee in 78 on controls and subsidies when the World Bank and the IMF came along in 1991, they were just recycling those arguments using a different jargon. The Alexander Committee, the Tandon Committee, the, the Abid Hussein Committee on the positive side. On the negative side, 
दत्त हजारी कारवे होल लॉट नाइनटीन नाइनटी वन आई थिंक वी सिंप्लीफाई वेन वी टेन टू थिंक नरसिंह राव मनमोहन सिंह द इनग्रीडियंट्स एंड मॉन्टेक विल करेक्ट मी इफ आई एम रॉन्ग द इनग्रीडियंट्स ऑफ द नाइनटीन नाइनटी वन पैकेज वो ऑलरेडी इन प्लेस बाई सेप्टेंबर नाइनटीन नाइनटी बिफोर द at all held so the much maligned bureaucracy if it is so maligned it's a wonder that these 69 reforms have happened it is a much maligned bureaucracy that pushes the reforms coming to your question rare is it the case that we economists we will talk about markets but markets do not function in a vacuum they are concepts the function in an institutional setting and that institutional setting is determined by the constitution and by the legal system how many economists understand the law forget about judges not understanding economics how many economists bother about the law other than gautam who has written on the law in the tomes and the tomes that have been written on faulty economic policies how many people will mention the idra act they won't now so far as the judiciary is concerned it's a long list but the simple answer is the following why do reforms happen all kinds of different reasons but one reason why the reforms happen is there is a demand for reforms there is a countervailing pressure manifesting itself in a democracy like ours through mlas mps parliament and eventually gets into the political system how many of us demand the accountability and transparency on the part of the judiciary we are perpetually blaming the executive we are sometimes blaming the legislature judiciary we are not bothered the police we are not bothered so until that happens i don't think the pressure will mount for reforms thank you vivek Uh, nirmala ji one question for you how do we manage the narrative of reforms especially after the farm laws it's not about how good the ideas are or how many experts across political spectrum agree that these are important and necessary reforms how do we win the narrative battle on this well i'm using your own words to manage the narrative is one thing to win the narrative is another most often you win the narrative if you are able to manage it and there are times when uh, the narrative goes into a spin without much grounding on facts then to establish the fact is the labor which you have to put in and after that you expect that the narrative can revert itself on the fundamental facts and then go on most often it becomes like a uh, gathering uh, moss you know it just keeps going and it doesn't gain any facts in its movement so it could also be used in the case of the farm laws whoever had an argument against the economics of it whoever had an argument about how much discussion has, ha has happened across the board all political parties had vouched for it so narrative succeeds when it starts early in anticipation of the problem if you had started an early early building a narrative and you're able to run the narrative along with the let's say the protests and if this gains then you you know manage the narrative so narrative is more i think the timing narrative is more the effort to through which you get the whole thing to come down to the hard facts so the managing of narratives has these two elements which will determine the success of it so clearly it is not limited to discussions within parliament or political discourse it is a public discourse and hence all platforms need to be mobilized in order to do that 
Gautam, now a question for you. And of course, this is all off the, uh, uh, you know, the format that you gave me, but it's just such an interesting conversation. Because I saw how passionate you are uh, in terms of deformers, you mentioned. That's a strong word. And yet, from what Montek said, and I, I tend to agree to that, that the distributional impacts, of course, you're worried about it. There is at the back of your head you're concerned about, but how do you, that has to be part of the reform, Gautam. So how do we, how do we manage that? Let me explain it you, uh, giving a very simple example. That, you know, when the Green Revolution happened, uh, or for instance, now when the energy transformation, we want just trans transformation, et cetera, to happen, technology is a very crucial part of it. That technology is something we have to get from outside, right? Just as the Green Revolution, most of it came from the Philippines. The government had a very large role in it in terms of getting it and deploying it, which meant working with the farmers and that, in that sense, in the energy transformation, we have to work with the firms to understand exactly what is preventing them from moving en masse to renewable. What are the true costs? What are the compliance burdens, regulatory burdens, et cetera? When you're thinking of reforms and, 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 and we're worried, even in the pension scheme, you have to think in terms of that. How do we take this group, which is disgruntled and which is definitely going to lose out, how do we take them along? So my reading of reforms, what I have seen is that governments tend to cave in to bullying. So the number of, for instance, uh, bank employees may be a small fraction, government employees may be another small fraction, farmers are large, but these small fractions of people have the power because they're going to lose something. That loss is visible to them. Uh, and they are more prone to getting together than the rest of us who say we are losing in any case. For instance, let's talk about uh, the, the pension deforms that we are talking about. Those who are in government service now are demanding a change of a contract where, or change in terms of service where they will get what some other people, maybe the last 10 years who are going to retire right now of a defined benefit uh, scheme. It's easy for them to get together. How easy it is, is it for people like us in this room to hit the streets to say pension deforms must not happen? It's very difficult. We are too busy doing our own thing. It's only when there is a loss to you that a constituency gets formed, either through associations, through trade unions, maybe uh, uh, by getting a political face, maybe by, uh, by uh, hanging on to some ancient logic uh, or data or, or making some emotive statements. For instance, this pension, it's so disgusting. I mean, not only does the person get that pension, after him the, the spouse gets the pension, after the spouse is gone, the, if there is an unmarried daughter, she gets a pension, where is this going to end? What, the, what are we doing here? So I think the, 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 the propensity for those who are um, losing something or perceiving a loss. By the way, pension funds are doing very well. If you, if you look at the numbers and see those pensions through the NPS scheme, they're doing very well. The, the, these people are not going to be in, in any loss. They just have to find a good annuity. Annuity reforms are needed. So Nirmala ji, uh, j just for your information, I, I think I couldn't help it. This just came out. I think we need reforms in the annuity sector. But if, if you get a good annuity, I think there is enough capital that can be made over a lifetime to sustain a higher standard of living than even perhaps the current defined benefit plan. It is very difficult for people like you and me to, like you and I can write some articles here and there, kind of bring out some book here and there, but we don't go to the street. It is, now, is it now, are we going to, my question back to somebody who is, is the street going to decide our economic policy? Is the street going to decide our politics? Is the street going to define the way that we engage with one another, our democracy itself? Is, does democracy have any meaning at all? Or if you just cobble up together, kill a few guys, and uh, uh, the world rushes to uh, with bleeding hearts, we're going to change our policies? I think this is a question that governments at the union, as well as in states, maybe even at a local level, need to face and counter firmly. I think what uh, Nirmala ji said about uh, winning the narrative 
and starting early, I think that that's a brilliant uh, uh, insight. So uh, in terms of economic reforms, we began with constraints. We have now reached conviction and perhaps the next step is consensus. But to reach that consensus, how do you reach a consensus where you see that you are opposing reforms simply because you, you, you are supposed to, there is no logic to that opposition. The farm laws, for instance. So I think you gather constituencies, political people feed on to it, suddenly it, uh, uh, it uh, gets a critical mass and reforms are held back or uh, reversed or repealed. And I think this is a, 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 a very, it's a difficult question. I, I don't have the answer right now, but I think people like Montek or Bibek or Nirmala ji or some other thinkers who, who've been in the, in, the, in the thick of action will be able to uh, answer this question. As, a, as, a, as an outsider, as, as a bystander, I can only weep. <laughs> Montek, I think we have five minutes. Uh, so, we, now this is um, going back to the Prime Minister's call on the Ravidi culture. I think eventually we are worried about that because we are, we are too, uh, it's a low middle income country. We are too poor right now to become irresponsible fiscally in, in the sense of keeping such myopic political objectives, if I may, and this is going back to the pension. And you have said uh, quite publicly that, that it's a reversal of, uh, of gains that we have made in, in the right direction. Now this is again a unique uh, situation where I think everyone on this dais uh, agrees that uh, going back to the old pension scheme could, could potentially become uh, you know, fiscally a huge burden. And yet now we are seeing state after state go back to it. There is a lot of posturing in terms of uh, even including BJP states, uh, people demanding. How do you bell a cat like this when clearly again the agreement is that the idea is a, is a difficult one. We, we cannot uh, go back on something which we have advanced upon. But politically we seem to be again down that slippery slope. Now again, how do you, uh, uh, how do you manage a situation like this? Is it about political differences? Is it about now? Are we, is the economics in some sense bowing at the altar of the political uh, process? Uh, which, which we have to now uh, try and uh, get everyone in the room to agree on something. Do you see that happening? Where do you, what do you think? Are you, how concerned are you about, about this? Well, I certainly share the view that this move is absurd. I mean, it, it's a recipe for just financial bankruptcy. Uh, the big advantage of those who push the move is that that bankruptcy will come 10 years later. So I think there's no, as an economist, I have nothing to say. The, the system must prevent both political parties or parties in power not to take steps that will lead inevitably to a financial disaster. How do you do that? Well, you know, to my mind, uh, this is where the narrative comes in. I think we need some effort so that people will explain uh, to the public at large or whatever it is, what are the costs of this? I mean, after all, if you translate it into a simple thing that here's the government willing to give me a better pension scheme than I have, okay? Uh, then if that's the only people who are consulted, I mean, they're going to say, well, look, I like this pension scheme. Uh, but clearly, somebody's paying for it. And so we need the narrative to focus on that. Now, somewhere in the political system, those who will bear the cost, I mean, their view has to be heard. And if the political system isn't able to do that, I have no solution. But I'm just saying that, you know, the same thing happens in other countries also. So, you know, we are going through a period where quite a lot of countries are doing politically irresponsible things. But then there is a correction. Uh, and the problem here is this is not being done in the central government. Uh, I suspect that, you know, there would be much greater national focus if such a move were made on the central government uh, by anyone. Uh, it's being done in state governments. So this is where, and this is something that Gautam talks about in the book, looking ahead, that the story of reforms have got to make sense at the state level. There are many reforms that need to be done which don't require the center to do anything. 
I mean, for example, the decriminalization of all kinds of compliance requirements in state laws. Even if the center didn't want to do it, even if you didn't change any law at the center, there's nothing stopping state governments from doing it, but they're not doing it. And you can make a list of things which are entirely in the realms of the state government. And from that point of view, it's not just the pension scheme. I mean, it's like, uh, what is the pricing policy you're going to follow for electricity? I mean, that is entirely a state government matter. The center, the center doesn't fix uh, uh, tariffs for electricity at the state level. Now, look at what's happening uh, in the climate change uh, area. We all realize, I mean, we have a national target to go down to net zero by 2070. Now, in order to go down to net zero by 2070, we have to bring in renewables. We also have a target for that. But at the state level, if you're bringing in this new investment, which is going to be more capital intensive, et cetera, and if it raises the price of electricity, are you going to pass that price on or not? Or are you going to say, no, farmers must be free, somebody else must be in a low price? I mean, you could have that problem could arise much faster than the pension problem. But the narrative has to, the narrative has to play out at the political level and in newspapers and indeed the informed public so that people are aware uh, that what's happening. Unless that happens, I mean, I don't see uh, an easy solution, frankly. And yet Pan Punjab is a case study in how things can unravel if it is left to the people and the popular short-term agendas being uh, uh, sort of uh, targeted towards. Because we see this used to be the richest state in the country 18 years back. Today an average, and Haryana was a lot, uh, lot uh, poorer. Today an average Haryanvi is one and a half times richer than a Punjabi. Punjab's per capita income is the same as Nagaland. We still don't know what is Nagaland's true economic model, right? In terms of is it a growth engine, we're not entirely uh, convinced yet. But Punjab used to be the breadbasket. Within 18 years, a series of myopic policies meant, and that is subsidies uh, to farmers, etc., at the expense of industry, meant that this was, it's a case study, because this is the only state where we have had active deindustrialization. Not very long back, but when we were in school 25, 30 years back, all sports equipments came from Punjab. A lot of textiles, sweaters, uh, bicycles, they all came from Punjab. Almost all those industries have pharmaceuticals. They have all moved away. Where did they go? To the neighboring states. Right? So sometimes the, the policies of the state, even if the state can bear the cost of it because you're cross-subsidizing in such a way that you can run this show for some time, but that is the fundamentals of economics, that the incentives over the long term will be such that you are going to, the, the budget is going to shrink. You're, not, you're just not going to be able to sustain bad policies over a very long period. Can I just come Why in Why can't Punjab become a case study? Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, it's a very important one because Punjab is looking to go back to that. It's a case study on why we cannot be going back to such myopic because, you know, when it's growth, it's a nice story. Everyone's doing well, we are growing. But the downturn is always going to be very difficult, right? It's already, it's painful. It's a, it's a border state, so it has added tensions. So perhaps we have to talk a lot more about such things. I think you, you mentioned well, narrative. I, I just I want to come in. I've done my bit on that because I was asked by the then chief minister several years, some years ago, I think it was Captain Amrinder Singh, that look, how do we bring Punjab back to the prime position it once had? So we got together a bunch of people and wrote a report, and it requir required them to do a lot of things, and I'm waiting to see if it gets done. <laughs> but I think it's, it's not that people don't know. I'm not saying that our report said it. I think if you ask any academic in Punjab, they also know. So you have to ask the question, why is it not translating into a political narrative? I Tough just want question. to come in here for, with one line, that's it. Just uh, then you can take it uh, wherever you want to. I think we've spent too much time, India has spent too much time in glorifying socialism and making it a big virtue. I'm saying give growth a chance, give capital a chance. Capital will create jobs. It will create an alternative model where every person lives a dignified life. We are constantly talking about inequality, as Bibek said in some, uh, some place, and I think I've cited him also. Let's talk about inequality at $20,000 per capita income. Let's grow. 
Let's not redistribute poverty. We've done enough of that. And I think we need to give this uh, capital a chance. We need to give growth a chance. We need to, uh, we need to uh, get over this uh, you know, momentum uh, of unthinking virtue signaling of, uh, of socialism. I, I think it has failed in India terribly. And it's time for another model. Let, let's go there. And that is the narrative, I would say, that uh, all of us here, the government, the, the thinkers, media, he mentioned, uh, need, need to follow. Big day. You shouldn't yes, call sir. it socialism, huh? because, I mean, you just let's be accurate. I mean, the guy who first talked about, I don't care about the color of a cat, as long as it catches mice, was Deng Xiaoping. And there's no bigger socialist than him. So, I mean, we use this term rather loosely. The, the truth of the matter is, there is a lot of confused thinking. If you find it comforting to call it socialist thinking, by all means do so. But it's actually just confused thinking. Uh, Dada, you had a comment. Nirmalaji? No, I just wanted to add to this. You need a se sequel to this book. <laughs> <laughs> because, <laughs> because you have so many things. Actually, even I was uh, quite enamored by, I don't know who said it. Why 69? Vivek said it. I can pick up on a few things which are not covered as reforms in this book, which have happened already. So a sequel is very much required. And the fact that the move from, that the passionate appeal saying move from socialism to something, and I quite agree with what you want to call it as socialism, you may call it, but then this confusion. That's the point I want to play on. There's no confusion now. I strongly believe in it. Not because I'm part of a government, but there's no confusion now because there's clearly the spirit of what is entitlement versus what is empowerment. And if you're looking at empowering people, there's no entitlement business. You give them the fundamental uh, requirements, amenities, as you referred to earlier. People find their own course to improve their living, their families can find opportunities, skills can happen, everybody moves towards a self-respecting way of moving forward. And that's where, to remove this confusion which comes up, which uh, Gautam also refers to, as uh, get out of socialism. Again, one of the prime points on which your sequel should start with is the 21 budget openly said privatize where government should not be. Move out of it, leave it to more efficient hands. The public enterprise policy was a distinct voicing of what 91 should have voiced. All right, at that time, I'm not finding fault what happened in 91 happened, and it was good for India. You opened up, you saw the way in which businesses are now prospering, opportunities are now coming, but what could have been done within the first 10 years or after 91? And even first 10 years, uh, or later 10 years after 2000, when the century, uh, the decade started, did not happen for whatever reason. But it's happening now in despite a pandemic. A policy has stated that we are no longer looking at socialism, Confucian or socialism. We are looking at clearly privatizing areas where government should not be. Leave it to more efficient hands. Get more money, put more equity, get the businesses happening, jobs coming. But government will have to be in some core areas, which is critical for national security, which is critical for communication, which is critical for defense, which is also critical for some of the primary areas in which government will have to be present. So once you go through the empowering stage, you get out of that feeling that there's somebody who's going to chip in. Instead, I have everything, every wherewithal with me that I can take care of my family and myself and move forward. Create opportunities, that's the business of the government. So I think that orientation is now completely moved out. 180 degrees change has happened. So your sequel will have to now look at what has that delivered? Has it delivered? Will it deliver? Will it take it? to the next 25 years of 2047 where we would want to be a developed country, better, higher income, per capita income, and so on. Uh, 
just one and a half points. The half one is, I'm shooting my mouth off. Why did the states agree to the NPS then? I suspect it was the pay commission then. I'm not suggesting anything to the finance minister, <laughs> but maybe that would be the trigger for them to reverse what they are trying to do. The one point, today we've allowed foreign universities to begin teaching in India. The first time I heard about this possibility was probably in 2005 or 2006 when the National Knowledge Commission was set up. It's taken us 16 years or 17 years. Question to ask is why has it happened now? I'm stretching the point a little bit, but I think the reason why it has happened now is enrollment in schools has gone up, even amongst the poor, across all the states, not always government schools, private schools also. So the demand now that these students are moving up the pipeline, the demand for competition and opening up in higher education has begun to surface through the students and the parents, which is why I referred earlier to the countervailing pressure. Montek mentioned this anecdote earlier, which I think is a very significant anecdote about the computer. This 69 I can't get, get out of my head. 60s Bollywood films, the villain is escaping with the heroine on a vehicle. The hero does not try to chase on a vehicle, he would never have caught up. He, he is astride a horse, doesn't follow the road and catches the villain. Much of the reforms, I think, do not involve a direct the reforms happen because there is an intergenerational issue. The older people will not want reforms. Reforms are not win-win, they are win-lose. But the reforms happen because there is a newer generation, younger generation, born after 91 or grown up after 91 who want the reforms. That is the bypass that is happening. That's the reason I think that today empowerment has become much more acceptable as compared to entitlement. The origins of socialism actually go back to Vartha. And today, I think were Vartha to happen, the expression socialism would not be used. And that has happened because the nature of Indian society has changed. Well, that's a great note of optimism. Uh, and of course, we are a young country, and uh, with such a large young population that also votes, uh, there, is, there is a sort of a self-correcting mechanism that, that we can be uh, optimistic about. Uh, I will end this conversation with one small anecdote, uh, which tells us that I think there is also a bit of a dissonance between what we aspire to be, and this is, uh, 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 you know, well into the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, when at that point, one of the advisors to the Prime Minister, uh, this was PC Mahalanobis, when uh, he mentioned that setting a minimum wage at such an early stage of uh, growth would be, is, a, is problematic. It's too high a bar. You're raising the costs too high. Citing Japan, that it took Japan almost 100 years of growth to attain a level at which point they brought in these kind of welfare reforms to say this is what minimum wages should be, thereby enforcing certain benefits and putting costs on the farms to ensure a larger social well-being in the form of a welfare, a minimum wage legislation. India is perhaps an anomaly in a lot of that because we were very young, we were too poor, but we went ahead with what we thought was the right thing. But clearly in a, in a hindsight, it is one of those things that we felt good about, but obviously the outcome was hugely distortionary as a result of which uh, a lot of our labor laws over time just kept getting distorted. It's only now that we're trying to unravel uh, the factor market and labor in particular through undoing some of that. Uh, there is certain amount of welfare that you can afford while you're still that poor. 
Uh, I think a lot of these conversations, uh, Gautam, the onus is on scholars, the onus is on thinkers and youngsters to write about it, to put more evidence. I think uh, the political battles will be fought uh, uh, on, on that front. Uh, but I think uh, you know, writing a book like this, uh, continuing to build on the narrative of what economic reform for the youth, for the future, the next 100 years for the countries. Been to be. I think it's an ongoing effort, but we are all fairly optimistic and bullish uh, on India. Thank you all for your time. We have had a very nice time. Thank you. Thank you, Shamika. That was a wonderful discussion. I'm sorry we could not take questions from the audience, but you would agree that this was um, entertaining by itself. This was an excellent um, set of uh, thinkers and speakers who uh, were in many ways also challenging each other uh, to, to think about uh, some of these questions more deeply. Um, uh, before I close, let me just invite Sagar back on stage from HarperCollins to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, Sachin, sorry. Uh, uh, please join us on stage, propose a word of thanks, and then we can all uh, continue with the rest of our lives uh, this evening in Delhi. Sachin, over to you. Well, what a wonderful evening we had, and, uh, except for this part, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you, uh, Honorable Finance Minister uh, Neymela Sitharamanji. Thank you, Mr. Montek Alowaliaji. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Debroy, Dr. Ravi. Thank you, Gautam. Uh, the books are available for sale here. The author is also available to sign copies for you. Please get yourself a copy. Thank you. <laughs>